Welcome to another session of Lectures by Lobezy. I'm your host, Dr. Lobezy. Thanks for watching. Today's video will be some of the events that contribute to the outbreak of World War II. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about Hitler, and uh, we're going to start with his violations of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, we're going to look at the sort of allied response, and we can call it the policy of appeasement, explain that. And then we'll look at some uh, German acts of aggression, primarily the Austrian Anschluss, uh, the events that contributed uh, to the Munich Conference, which surrounds uh, an area of Czechoslovakia known as the Sudetenland, and um, later uh, prior to the invasion of Poland, uh, the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> okay, so one of the things that uh, Adolf Hitler um, decided to do, and this was uh, discussed in an earlier video, was uh, to combat the effects of the Great Depression in an attempt to bring about a recovery. And he did that really kind of by following the advice of John Maynard Keynes, and that was uh, through the implementation of um, deficit spending. And he did so uh, primarily through public works projects. Um, he the, the, the lion's share of the focus was on rearmament, um, but there were other public works projects that were designed to sort of dry up unemployment, uh, including uh, one of the most famous projects was the construction of the Audubon, um, that very famous uh, uh, highway system that exists in Germany. Um, so prior to his violations, which, I mean, the, the rearmaments and the building up of the uh, German military was you know, a, um, a, a violation of the Treaty of Versailles. And Adolf Hitler was kind of banking on the fact that the Western allies uh, were going to be hesitant to go back, you know, uh, would, would be hesitant to stop him because they wanted to prevent an, uh, another world war. Uh, and, and he especially sensed that French was, uh, France was unwilling to go it alone without the support of Great Britain. And Great Britain had sort of returned to its old uh, days of splendid isolation, kind of relying on a, the British uh, or the English Channel to kind of keep it safe from the affairs of the continent of Europe. All right. So Adolf Hitler announces in March 1935 the creation of a new air force. And then one week later, a military draft to um, bring the army uh, up to a the, the size of 550,000 men, which was a violation of the Treaty of Versailles, which held that the limit should be only 100,000. Okay, uh, the Allied countries, you know, sort of condemn this, but do nothing. All right, and so we know now, historians know now by researching internal documents and you know letters and uh, as such. And communications between Hitler and his inner circle was that was had had the Allies taken early on a uh, strong stand against his violations of the Treaty of Versailles that Hitler very easily could have been boxed in. Okay, but let's talk about the policy of appeasement. And um, you know, today poli uh, the, the term appeasement is when it's thrown around uh, by politicians or by, you know, pundits, um, you know, media pundits, it, it, it's, it's not a compliment. Uh, it's a derogatory term. It, it's designed to show weakness. Um, and, you know, we, we use the lesson of uh, what happened prior to World War II um, as, as a reason not to embrace appeasement. But, uh, the Brits, especially, uh, and other Europeans were not at all afraid to uh, use the policy of appeasement. Uh, they thought it was effective. It was, a, it was a tool that would help prevent future war, and it was to give in to an aggressor country uh, so that my, uh, peace might be maintained. 
Um, <clears throat> you might recall that the Treaty of Versailles was particularly harsh to Germany. And so, you know, a generation almost has passed uh, since the uh, Treaty of Versailles. And there seems to be a softening of the uh, position that many people had uh, in, in relation to Germany. And I guess, you know, there was a little bit of guilt in the sense that uh, the, you know, the people at the, uh, the decision makers at the Paris Peace Conference, um, Clemenceau and David Lloyd George, might have been might have been particularly too you know harsh uh, on Germany maybe too harsh, and so perhaps you know a little bit of latitude and grace uh, could be uh, granted uh, to Germany. Okay, and so that's just sort of the uh, um, you know the the background for uh, the, the thinking with regard to why appeasement would be a good idea. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at another violation of the Treaty of Versailles and. Um, one of the things that uh, Germany was not to do was um, they were not to militarize the Rhineland. It was to remain a demilitarized zone. And that was something that France was quite adamant about because uh, they, they, they felt that uh, they needed a buffer zone. All right. And uh, actually, France wanted this to be kind of like an international uh, zone and um, sort of not anybody's territory, uh, something that would, have, you know, be ma managed, uh, perhaps by the League of Nations. Uh, but ultimately it was decided that this would remain, the Rhineland would remain in inside of Germany, it would be part of their territory, but, uh, it would be a violation of the treaty to, uh, have any military posts or troops located there. So again, to serve as a, a buffer zone. So one of the first thing, or the second thing that Hitler does in March of 36 is he, reoccupies or remilitarizes the Rhineland, okay? No, so uh, France, again, is very concerned about this, uh, terrified, in fact, uh, but they do not feel confident enough to do anything without the support of their allies, and that would include the United States, but most specifically Great Britain, and both countries were not terribly interested, uh, especially Great Britain with regard to, uh, because of their policy of appeasement. Uh, this lack of action by France and Great Britain further solidified um, in, in Hitler's head the idea that they were terminally weak uh, and that there really was nothing that he couldn't, uh, you know, squeeze out of them. Okay. During this time period, uh, Hitler also forges an alliance with Italian dictator Benito uh, Mussolini in what is known as the uh, Rome-Berlin Axis. Um, and we will see that once the war begins, they act in a uh, coordinated fashion, uh, working together uh, to uh, advance, you know, their, uh, their goals. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. The other thing uh, that... Hold on one second. I got a, a dog that he has to go outside. Sorry about that. Anytime you hear the little click clacking of uh, claws, that's Leland. Uh, had to go to the restroom. All right. So anyway, where are we at? Uh, the other uh, pact or, um, yeah, you know, sort of defensive alliance that is created is the anti common turn pact between Japan and uh, uh, Nazi Germany as an attempt to um, kind of combat communism. Okay, so this is uh, uh, a union against uh, the Soviet Union. Okay, uh, it says the Treaty of Versailles had been virtually scrapped and hey, Germany was once more a world power, as Hitler proclaimed. Uh, what else do we want to talk about here? Um, oh, I'll, I'll just kind of tip my hand uh, when we get into World War II. So as I said, that uh, Germany and Italy would kind of fight in, um, and kind of link forces and um, in a... In a cooperative fashion, but um, Japan and Germany do not. Uh, they kind of just stay out of each other's way and they're just, you know, sort of allies. So they don't have any like coordinated um, uh, battles or anything like that. They don't necessarily work together. All right. So, um, yep, let's go on to the next slide. Okay. Uh, next slide talks about uh, ongoing rearmament. Uh, and I just want to point out here 
that uh, how much uh, Germany is going to spend. Okay, so this says uh, this is in millions of Reichmarks. Uh, so this ends up being like billions. So 1.9 in 1934, they're on, on the German Wehrmacht, the German military, they're spending uh, 1.9 uh, billion uh, 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 Reichmark. Um, and then if we go all the way to 1938, 39, it's saying 17 billion. Although I did see a different, I saw a different statistic that said, that that number was a little bit higher that it was uh yeah right here then by 1939 it was 30 billion so not sure which one's right uh but that's a very significant increase in expenditures okay and uh also during this time period what the uh what the germans are doing is developing their battle tactics which uh they're going to uh, be called blitzkrieg and that is uh, taking some of the technology that was introduced during world war one name namely the tank and the airplane and improving upon them and then also finding better ways to kind of uh, integrate them into a, an invasionary force some way to uh, kind of you know combine that with infantry all right and so what you're going to see is with blitzkrieg um anytime the germans attack uh, at first they're going to send in the air force and they're going to bomb military targets and installations and railroads and things like that to try to, you know, uh, disrupt troop movements and, you know, destroy factories or whatever. And then the second phase is going to be uh, the use of uh, fast moving mechanized units uh, and the tanks are going to kind of like punch through and uh, at various points in the, you know, the enemy's line and they're, they're there to uh, create a, a tremendous, a tremendous amount of chaos. And then like these, um, these mechanized uh, transports are going to um, move beyond enemy lines and uh, rapidly move troops. Okay, so uh, they're, they're going to perfect that. And uh, when the war begins, they're going to utilize it. Okay, in a, in a way to quickly defeat their enemies. Okay, Blitzkrieg. Uh, another thing that's import, important to note here is uh, by 1939, their military has grown from 550,000 to four and a half million. Okay, so, um, you know, historians say it, it would have been wise if the uh, Allied powers, France and Great Britain, if they would have acted earlier, uh, much of the death and destruction of World War II could have been avoided. Okay, so uh, if you go back to uh, Mein Kampf, which was the book written by uh, Hitler when he was in prison, one of the goals that he uh, established in that book was uh, the unification of all German-speaking people, okay, like a pan-German movement. Uh, and so this is the country of his birth, Austria. So he plans for the um, unification of, of Germany and Austria. And this, too, is considered a violation of, uh, not, not just a violation of the Treaty of Versailles, but an all-out act of aggression. But Neville Chamberlain, um, kind of lets it be known that, um, you know, as, as long as this is done peacefully, uh, Great Britain is not going to stand in the way. Okay. And so there's a few things that happen internally, but some threats are made, um, from Hitler to the, uh, Austrian chancellor. And, um, it, it, it sort of intimidates, uh, the Austrians and they end up allowing, uh, the German military to move in and unify with the country in uh in march march 13th, 12th and 13th okay so <clears throat> that's gonna be known as the austrian anschluss okay and uh, as you can kind of see let me move this my head out of the way here you can see that germany has you know its size has grown considerably okay so let me move that back there let's go on to the next slide all right so the next uh, territory that we got to talk about is in Czechoslovakia. It's a it's an area that had been taken from them after World War One, the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles, because of uh, what was it called um, self determination, created nine new countries uh, to try to prevent nationalistic uprisings in the future. Okay, so <clears throat> Czechoslovakia was created and uh, it was you know kind of carved out of Austria and uh, Germany, and so. This uh, 
this little piece of territory right here is called the Sudetenland. And the reason why Hitler wants it back is because it's home to 3 million ethnic Germans. All right. And so September 1938, Hitler makes his demands known. He, you know, basically issues an ultimatum, says, if we don't get the Sudeten back, um, Sudetenland back, we're going to go to war. All right. And so in an attempt to kind of prevent that from happening, uh, funny enough, um, Benito Mussolini calls for a conference to be held. Okay. And so four countries uh, are invited. Uh, the conference is to be held in Germany, uh, the Munich conference. Uh, so Great Britain, France, uh, Germany, and Italy are there. Strangely enough, uh, Czechoslovakia is not invited. Okay. So the British, um, uh, that's, um, that's Neville Chamberlain. Um, their, uh, prime minister, obviously that's Adolf Hitler. Also in attendance is the, uh, uh gosh, uh, the French president or is it president or premier. I always forget. It's Deladier is his name. And then, of course, uh, Benito Mussolini. All right. So really the two big decision makers here are Adolf Hitler and uh, Neville Chamberlain. Um, so this is what happens. Uh, it's pretty simple. Adolf Hitler says if uh, the Sudetenland is returned to Germany, then that will be his last territorial demand in Europe. And that peace will you know uh, uh, ensue so uh, <clears throat> he's you know they signed the document uh, Neville Chamberlain treats Adolf Hitler as a gentleman like he's a man of his word uh, he goes back uh, to England and uh, is sort of celebrated as a hero uh, and he promises that there will be peace in our time well Within six months, Adolf Hitler occupies the rest of Czechoslovakia, and he looks like a fool. Uh, and then when, well, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but the, I don't want to. But here, the one thing that uh, is worth noting is not everybody agreed with this policy of appeasement. And there was one British uh, politician in particular who just absolutely... Uh, did not understand and disagreed wholeheartedly was uh, Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill at this time was a uh, was a member of parliament. Okay. So anyway, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. All right. So on to the uh, next slide. Uh, <clears throat> so with each step, Hitler is becoming more and more, the word is emboldened. Okay. So this is why you don't give your lunch money to the bully because um, the bully you think you're solving the problem by making him go away because uh, he's you know he's not going to pick you up and shove you in a trash can or lock you throw you in a locker um, but by giving him the money he knows that you're an easy mark and that he can come back and take more and make bigger demands in the future so at some point you're gonna have to stand up to the bully okay and this is what um, the, you know, the Allied powers, uh, you know, Great Britain and France kind of realized that Hitler cannot be trusted. He is not a man of his word and he is just a thug. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> let's talk about this territory here. Um, as I mentioned, the Treaty of Versailles, because of that, uh, nine new European countries were created. One of them was Poland and, uh, you know, Poland had a come from somewhere so they carved a lot of it out of germany or at least some of it and um it's it's interesting because they wanted to give poland access to the sea but uh the way in which they did that they carved it like they divided up germany okay so you got germany here and then this little sliver over here in the east it's called east prussia but it's actually part of um part of germany and so what Hitler starts demanding is for the return of what is known as the Polish Corridor. He wants this territory returned to Germany. Um, and, you know, at this point, uh, Great Britain has promised Poland that they would be willing to defend uh, them should uh, Germany attack, invade, what have you. Uh, but... Hitler thinks they're bluffing. 
he doesn't think that Great Britain's going to do anything. He thinks that they're just a bunch of worms. Uh, so uh, he he starts planning, you know, having his generals uh, plan their attack. Okay. Now let's talk about this. Okay. So <clears throat> in order uh, to to prevent um, him from having to fight, I guess what you would call a two front war. Uh, the thinking is that if, if Germany invades Poland, then that's going to make the Soviets uh, nervous and they might declare war on Germany. Okay. And if, if when Germany invades Poland, if Great Britain and France declare war against Germany, then, you know, there is that potentiality for a two front war. So to kind of hedge his bets and prevent that from happening, um, Hitler and Stalin signed the Nazi Soviet non-aggression pact or their, you know, like their foreign ministers do. Okay. And that's August 23rd, 1939. And so when this is made public, it shocks the world because, you know, you got two, uh, you got a far right guy and a far left guy, right? Hitler and, and Stalin. And it's, you know, they, they hated each other. So th this, the idea that they are going to come together and form this non-aggression pact, um, it doesn't mean they're going to help each other. It just means they promise not to fight each other for a period of 10 years. It shocks everyone. Okay. Um, but what's even more shocking is the secret part. It's the secret part of the non-aggression pact. And that is that they're going to divide up Poland. Okay. So they're going to, the Eastern half is going to go to Germany and the Western half is going to go to, uh, the Soviet union. Now, um, Hitler, you know, kind of down the road, a couple of chess pieces down uh, later, he, he does have plans to invade the Soviet Union. And I'm pretty sure uh, Stalin knows that, uh, but they're just kind of buying time because in addition to Eastern Poland, um, Finland and the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are also going to be seized uh, by the Soviet Union. So that's going to kind of create a buffer zone, if you will, and help them regain some lost territory from World War I. And that will help them sort of bolster the, their defenses should uh, an invasion um, or a war with uh, Germany be in the future. Okay, so they invade, the Germans do, uh, they invade uh, Poland in uh, September 1st, okay? Uh, an ultimatum is, uh, is issued. Uh, by Neville Chamberlain to Hitler, uh, get out or we'll declare war. Hitler, of course, thought that they were bluffing, so he did nothing. And then two days later on September 3rd, Great Britain and then France declared war on Poland. Okay, they don't do anything to help, though, uh, <laughs> which is pretty disappointing for the Poles. Um, but, um, yeah, so that date, September 3rd, 1939, is also used by historians to denote the start of World War II. So that's a date you should know, September 3rd, 1939. Okay, and then two weeks later, uh, the Soviet Union sent troops uh, into Eastern Poland and Poland will fall uh, as a result relatively soon. Okay, all right. Well, thanks for watching this video. Uh, next video, we'll actually get into World War II. All right, thanks.